It's really important to know what to do, but just as important to know what you should not do. There are some leadership behaviors to watch out for and to avoid. Leaders' behavior can have negative consequences in the long run. What can be complex is that many behaviors that have a long-term negative effect can actually be experienced as having a short-term positive effect. And it can then be tempting for leaders to fall for the short-term positive effect. But let's not do that. In this video, we address three unwanted behaviors, too much praise for successful actions, permanent leveling, and punishments. What you should avoid is, first of all, to give too much praise for successful actions. Succeeding in an action is strengthening in itself. When a player tries something new or challenges herself in another way, it is good to give praise. Compare it with a toddler who is just starting to learn to get up and start walking. Then we give a lot of praise for the effort. Again and again, we praise the child for trying repeatedly. But then when the child can walk, we don't praise her for it all the time. Of course, we can even praise an older child because she walks. If, for example, we're on a hike and it's a long way to go, or we go up a mountain, or she's challenged in some other way. But then we don't praise her for walking. We praise the effort that she puts in in the face of a challenge. So to take it back to the football field, it can be a player who hits a 10 meter pass with precision with her right foot, and the ball gets where it's intended to most of the times. That player doesn't need to be praised for every 10 meter pass that she, she hits. However, when the player uses the other foot or tries to hit a longer pass, then we can praise her for the effort to encourage the player to try again and again, regardless of whether the, the ball went where it was aimed for or not. So if coaches give too much praise for successful actions, we risk players getting labels as good or less good, and the chance that players dare to challenge themselves with new things decreases. It is fun for both players and leaders when the player succeeds. It is a short-term positive effect. But the successful outcome is strengthening in itself. Those who succeed and often receive praise are often labeled as good football players. But those who do not succeed as often are often labeled as less talented. A label that is good can become a burden when other players catch up in their development or players change the environment to one where other players are better. Players tend to only do what they're good at and avoid things that they are less good at so as not to fail and lose their label as good. Parts of the player's game will therefore not develop. This is what is called the talent trap. And for players labeled less good or less talented for lack of praise, they tend to not want to try because they become afraid of failing. They won't think it's fun and eventually they will stop playing. So to keep all players motivated and in the game, make sure to praise them when appropriate, but don't praise them too much and for everything. Instead, as a leader, focus on strengthening, praising, and encouraging attempts and efforts instead of the results and outcomes. And make sure to distribute your attention to all players. The second behavior you should avoid as a coach is permanent leveled groups. Always dividing your team into the same groups risks giving players labels. It stimulates focus on results and with it also comparison with others. Motivation and development are unpredictable and vary over time. It can be tempting to always divide the team according to players' technical level into A and B teams. Leaders can experience short-term positive effects because players are challenged at their level and the training flows well. However, the long-term effect that it results in is that players in the B team know that they're in the B team and they develop poor self-confidence and are labeled as B team players, while players who are in the A team 
become afraid of losing their place and may not dare to try new things and do things that they do not master yet. So this increases the risk of focusing on comparison, comparing oneself to, to others, which can lead to stress and anxiety. To benefit players' development, it is important that everyone sometimes plays with players that have less developed football skills, which means that the player needs to take more responsibility. Sometimes they need to play with players that have more advanced football skills to challenge themselves a little extra. And sometimes they need to play just with equally good football players to feel safe and practice repetition. So even though there is no evidence that dividing teams into permanent leveled groups is beneficial, it is still very common. So here are the best arguments for why we should not divide teams into different levels. So is it for the individual player's best or for the coach's best? The only actual benefit of dividing the team into leveled groups is that it's easier for you as a coach to conduct the training session when all players are more or less equally at the same level of development. But are you having training sessions for yourself or are you there for your players? If you are a football coach that wants to develop your players, then do what's best for the players and not what's easiest for you. Comparing players with each other often results in a competitive motivation climate, which is worse for long-term development and the player's well-being, since players are then motivated by external factors rather than their own internal motivation. The risk is that the coach's expectations are also affected by the labels instead of the player's actual development. Remember the power of the self-fulfilling prophecy, the Pygmalion effect. Leveled groups come from an adult perspective. This way of organized competition was created for adult elite players and then just transferred to youth sports. But children and youth are not small adults. They are children and should be coached according to their needs and not adults' needs. There is loads of evidence suggesting that dropouts increase with leveled groups, so if you want to keep your players in the game, let them play together. The risk is that leveled groups are divided based on physical maturity, which in itself does not, does not say anything about performance over time. Remember the relative age effect. Remember that we need to take into account our players' biological age and not just stare blindly at their chronological age. Permanently level groups have strong connections with early specialization that children only practice one sport and the myth of 10,000 hours or deliberate practice. Repetition is important, but there are many factors influencing your development other than the hours you put into your practice. And the more diverse your training is, the better your performance. When dividing your team, the focus often ends up on individual activity, since it is concrete and can be assessed and controlled. This risks losing the focus of the team development and performance, since the long-term development is more complex and difficult to see. When dividing your team, players often develop a negative relationship with mistakes or failures, when in fact, mistakes and failures are really an important part of the development process and should be encouraged. Remember that you as a coach is a role model in your way of being, talking, and through your treatment of the players. The coach has a great effect on how children and young people think about themselves, how they look at their development and potential, and also how they think about each other and how they look at their teammates' development and potential. So focus on varying the group composition and individualized challenges. Prepare the group composition already in your planning so that you over time have made sure that everyone can train and play with everyone and that you have a routine that the players get used to. 
During the various exercises, plan for making it easy to get started with exercises quickly. Let, let the players practice and try a few times so they know what to do and then you can add on and develop the exercise further with regards to players' individual level. Then you create the opportunity for um, yourself as a coach to give individual instructions and challenges in the exercise, which is in its basic form is based on football action and interactions that the player performs in the game. When you also, as a natural part of the training, let players participate in giving suggestions for exercises, talking and reflecting with the coach and the team, you get more focus on development and learning instead of comparisons and classifying each other as good or bad players. The third leadership behavior to avoid is punishments. So we've talked throughout the training about that what you as a coach want to see more of should also be encouraged. Therefore, also coaches should avoid punishments. Players who are punished learn to focus on what should not be done instead of what should be done. Since they're not given an instruction for the behavior that you want to encourage and see instead, and you clearly show, since you through the punishment actually highlight and emphasize the behavior you don't want, that this is something that players will get attention for, even though it's negative attention. Punishments also risk deteriorating the relationship between players and leaders, decreasing the level of trust created. There is a risk that the unwanted behavior may continue when the leader does not see. Trainings can sometimes be messy and loud and players do not listen to instructions and, you know. Then punishments can have a short-term effect in the form of it resulting in calm and quiet. But in the long run, the players do not learn how to behave. So punishment often instead results in players only avoiding the behavior when you as a leader is not watching. Punishment also risks creating fear for those who hand out the punishment or threaten with punishment, which worsens the relationship further and creates a power relationship that can also result in players maltreating each other to try and exercise power over each other. So don't punish your players. Instead, focus on reinforcing the behaviors that you want the players to do more of. If reprimands are needed, reprimand players individually in special situations. Immediately trying to end a behavior can be important, especially if players uh, behave in a dangerous way, risking injury to themselves or another player, or acting in a way that goes against the team's co-created culture. But when denouncing this behavior or reprimanding a player, always be very clear that it is what the player does that is not acceptable. It must not be confused with who the player is. So leaders encourage good behavior. You will pay attention to and praise the behavior you want to see more of and ignore what is not desirable. If you though need to correct, reprimand, or criticize a player's behavior, always distinguish between what the player does and who the player is. So you're clear that you're reprimanding the player's behavior and not the player as a person. So for example, instead of saying, I don't want you to do this, you're being mean to the other player, you say, I don't want you to do this, when you act in this way, it's mean towards the other player. So what is important is also that the coach is clear in communicating the behavior you want to see instead of the inappropriate behavior. So that you as a leader with your reprimand create the opportunity for the player to change her behavior. So adding on, I understand that you're frustrated, but instead of shouting like that towards your fellow player, you can wait until later and then explain to her that you would rather want her to pass the ball in front of you, for example. So just like we did in this video, we have described a behavior that we do not want to see and why we do not want to see it, 
and then we have described the behavior we want to see instead.